What does that even mean? I don't even understand. What does that even, that. Is that like related to Jesus take the wheel? Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Arenacast. This is Raj. I'm Bonnie. I'm Casey. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This episode, you get three of the Arenacast Fab Five. Jeff and Alan are on assignment, and our topic for today is theologies, plural. Bum, bum, bum. So we're going to dive right in. We're going to go over a few different theologies and share some perspectives on them. We'll start with liberation theology. Hmm. Liberation theology. One of my favorite theologies. It is uh, where I am rooted, I believe. Um, it was formed by Gustavo Gutierrez in Peru. He was a Catholic priest he he saw colonialism and how Christianity had been used to abuse um, his community, his country, the world, right? And that the Christ that he knew and the Christ that was showing up in his community was not the Christ that was being preached on Sunday morning and was being spoon-fed to his parishioners. Uh, with the mix of uh, capitalism and Christianity that that continued to poison his country and culture— he he felt that there needed to be something to reclaim Christ. Yeah, liberation theology, I think, is um, it's a pivotal time in in the life of Christianity. Uh, certainly, it helps us to remember that um, God is on the side of the oppressed, and that whenever there are oppressed peoples in the world, the kingdom is not here yet. Right. So That's it, right. it constantly kind of keeps us in this not yetness. Right. Um, which is, you know, what Jesus, I think, proclaimed all over the place. It's at hand, but not yet. Right. right. So um, liberation theology, it really should be liberation theologies, because what he started, um, what Gutierrez started, went in so many different directions among different op oppressed peoples. Right. And each one interpret interpreting liberation theology for their own groups. Right, their own perspective. Yeah. So for Gustavo, there's three types of poor. Like, I'm glad that you brought that up, right? There's um, those who are spiritually poor, those who are um, economically poor, and then those that are on the side of the poor. And for Gustavo Gutierrez, he would say that um, if you want to find Christ, you will always find Christ in the poor. And if you want to know Christ, if you want to um, truly understand Christ, that's where you have to be also. Yeah. So it's found in experience and experiencing the pain, experiencing the poor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, w one of the things about uh, liberation theology is it is preferential treatment for the poor. But as progressive Christians, we're working on the kingdom of God being in the here and now. Um, what happens when that goal is achieved? There's debate on whether it can be or not, but that we believe that we can certainly get there or pretty close. So what happens when there aren't people to, quote, liberate? Then it's a new age. And we don't know what happens when there aren't people to liberate because we're, we're not there. I mean, the, the time will, the old will have passed away and the new will have begun, I guess. I hate to, I hate to even use a scripture, right? But Jesus says the poor will always be among you. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean, right? I mean, some people have used that as a way to, to write off the poor, right? right? One of my favorite community organizers, um, Saul Alinsky, talks about the idea that once someone has been liberated, they all they always seem to find someone else to uh to to bind up, right? And this is a sad cycle in which humanity exists. Like we just do this. Um and so I don't I, I feel so like cynical, but maybe maybe there will never be a time when there are not people among us that that are in need of release. I mean, that's what the year of Jubilee is about, right? Like the setting free of all people. And that's what God Jesus killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, like we need to um, recognize that, that um, it's not just justice and freedom for people who are poor, but 
justice and freedom for people who are broke, you know, um, economically, spiritually. I mean, there are so many layers to poverty. Uh, and I don't know if we'll ever achieve that. I, I like to believe that we will achieve that, that it's possible to achieve that. And I know the cycles can repeat um, and do and you know often do repeat. We get stuck again and again and again. But I think the good news in Jesus's message is that even though that may be our tendency and it's so deeply rooted in who we are, we are always capable of breaking that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it yeah, we may we don't know if we'll see it in right. our lifetimes. Right. We don't know and, and there are multiple cycles that are happening all the time. So perhaps there'll be a breaking free of one. Like perhaps we could eradicate, say, racism. Right. And that doesn't mean that all the other things will have been eradicated at the same time. But right. I do I I agree with Dr. King when he says that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Right. And I guess that's maybe what I was saying. Like, I'm not saying that I, that I don't think it's possible. It's just, I don't think that we will see it. Right. But, but that's sort of what faith looks like, right. That we work towards this thing that we may never see. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I agree with that. What do you think, so, Raj? Well, yeah. I mean, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. And I, I think that sentiment, and, and I can't remember it exactly, but in the Jewish tradition, there is um, one of the great teachers says, you know, you are not required to finish the work, but neither are you absolved from the work itself. Yes. Or, yeah. you, know, you, you don't get to quit, but, you know, we know you're not going to finish it. Uh, so that ties in. So, you know, the, Annie Lamott writes about her pastor. I think it's Pastor Veronica. Hmm. And Pastor Veronica says, no one gets to heaven without a reference letter from the poor. Yeah. Yeah. How does that notion tie into your understanding of liberation theology? I think it relates to those different kinds of poor that Casey was talking about. Um, the experience of being poor and experience alongside of poverty Jesus coming into the world as a, a very fragile, vulnerable infant without a lot of, into a family without a lot of resources. Um, it, that that phrase nobody gets into into heaven without a reference letter from the poor. It, it's it's what's behind Jesus' call to the rich young ruler when he says, "How do how can I be saved?" And Jesus says, uh, give everything away, give it to the poor. And I think he, could, he couldn't do it in that moment, but perhaps he did it later. We don't know. But I think that's exactly what that phrase is all about. Whatever you've done for me, you've, or you've done for the least of these, you've done for me, right? Yeah. Um, and so for me, the idea is that when you encounter any person, you are encountering Christ. And how do you honor that person with dignity and respect and value, even when it's hard? I recently uh, was getting ready for a sermon about this very thing, and I normally get to church really early. For uh, I get to church really early and sort of like just have my time there. And there was a homeless guy walking up to the church as I was walking in. And I immediately went to this place of like, how dare you interrupt my time, right? Um, but then there was a sudden thing of like, if you can't, if you can't show up for this man as Christ, then you have no right to preach this sermon this morning. And I share that only to say that I think that um, this ref, this idea of a reference letter, also, who knows, who knows about heaven anyway? But, um, but in our, but how we treat people how we are able to um, interact with them, we should always be interrupted by Christ. Like we should always be able to come to a place of saying the very person in front of me, whether they be poor or wearing a MAGA hat, right? They embody Christ. And how do I honor that? Absolutely. Yeah, and it could be argued the the MAGA hat wearers are probably poor in spirit. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I mean, yeah. there, there's a lot yeah. of brokenness that I think undergirds this rise 
uh, in support of, of Donald Trump and his ilk. Uh, and that brokenness needs to be recognized. But um, the reference letter for the poor, I think, is a really powerful construct in this conversation because to get a reference letter, either to write one or receive one that's legitimate, it requires relationship, right? Yes. So it moves right. people beyond charity <laughs> right. and into relationship. So talk a little bit about the, the value of relationship as it connects to liberation theology. I think liberation theology sees the manifestation of God in, within the poor and, um, and that it's one's relationship with God through interacting with the poor that um, is relationship with God. But I, I, I like to talk about relationship more in the context of process theology. I don't know if we're, we're ready we're, to move we're into get that there. yet. We're not even close. Um, don't don't jump yeah, the gun Casey, just yet. But we can come back to that. What do you think? I think it starts with talking about pain. So Gustavo Gutierrez and also James Cone, right? Uh, James Cone talks about the crucified black Christ, um, that, that these are lived experiences. Um, I know that, uh, that Christ walks with me because Christ has experienced what I've experienced through persecution, even to the lynching tree, right? Even to the, to the cross. Those are all symbols of power and dominance being used to, subject another. And so um, in terms of a reference letter, it's how close to the pain are you? How how deeply are you willing to get in? You know, I, I remember um, in seminary, them giving us like this image of of a ditch. And they were like, you don't want to get into the ditch with the person, right? You want to stand on the outside and help them in, you know, help them out of the mud or what some like that. Um, and that always bothered me. Because I don't think that that's what God does in the example of Christ, and I don't think that that's what liberation theologians would say. If you want to truly know Christ and you want to truly know the experience of another, you have to be willing to get in the damn ditch. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, too, with liberation theology, um, it, it brings out intersectionality and the relationships between um, ecological devastation, racism sexism, you know, all of the the ways that people are oppressed. And liberation theology helps us connect all of those things in relationship to one another and it also in relationship to God. And it also says that you don't have to understand my experience. You don't have to you don't have to understand my experience to trust that it's true. Um and I mean that goes back to our uh, episode on racism. Um, episode 133? 33. 33. Oh, 34? I don't know. I'm not good with the numbers. Right. Sorry, Jeff. But um, I mean, that, that, this, that your experience of Christ and your experience, I mean, all of that is experiential. It's, and, and I don't have to um, have lived your experience to trust that it's true. Um, and so the way that you encounter Christ isn't necessarily going to be the way that I encounter Christ, but it doesn't make it less authentic or less real. It just means it's true to you. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. ep episode 134. Um, any other thoughts I want to transition to queer theology? Do you want to add anything to that, Raj? How do you see relationship and liberation theology connected? Um, well, I, I, I think relationship is essential. Well, to all the theologies we're going to discuss, really, because I, part of it is the framework of God. In the whole in the Christian uh, mythology, Jesus is here to be in relationship with humanity, and and so it, it's a an intimate walk with the divine. I mean, that's the whole impetus of of the faith. So, anytime we work to stay at arm's length, we're antithetical to the Christian impulse and the Christian calling. That, that's my take on, on relationship. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with Pastor Veronica 100%. And when you say um, Christian mythology, for people who might not relate to that term, what do you mean? Uh-oh, we're going to take a detour, I guess. So mythology, I don't mean that in a dismissive way, mm -hmm. but myth is powerful. 
a myth in the human experience causes life changing mind altering behavior altering awarenesses and so the christian mythology um is rooted in divine truth and it has taken on story form over the ages that helps motivate us into a higher way of being in relationship. So with you one mean another. the story of Christianity, the yeah. story that Christianity tells? Well, yes. And, and myth in any religious tradition is about something much deeper than just a, a tale of entertainment. It's something that draws you into doing more and being more. Uh, and asking more of yourself. So, yeah, not to, it's, it's, it's not a term I use to diminish anything, but to lift up the story or the scripture. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the danger of, of Reverend Bonnie it's getting sidetracked. So queer theology, Casey, you, you may be our resident expert. Yeah, I, I, I might be, I don't know. Um, so for me, uh, I, I always like to start with um, an explanation of queer because a lot of times um, that word in the past, much like the Bible, has been used to oppress LGBT people and harm them. Um, but I use queer often because that LGBTQQIAA list, it's just getting longer and longer, right? And so people of the alphabet. That's right. The people of the alphabet and the rainbow. The word queer can easily be odd or different, but I like I like the definition of the pushing up against norm, the normative. Mm -hmm. I love that understanding of queer mm -hmm. to push to push against the normative, um, because I think just being queer in general in the face of a normative world is radical, right? To live out your life in a way um, that is different than um, the structured system alone is a radical thing. And so uh, for me, um, there again, it's rooted in your body, rooted in your, in your experience as a queer person. So a lot of times I will refer to gay clubs and pride parades and bathhouses as the kingdom of God as church, um, because those have been safe places for queer people. Um, in the wake of a, a a world that was not welcoming, right? And so, um, yeah. What else do you want to know? It's it's also um like a way of interpreting scripture, right? right? And yeah, that's right. Like blurring the lines, noticing within the story itself how things are not normative. That's right. Like it, and yeah, it's it's a practice. That's right. For example, um. I just posted it on my blog at the queerly faithful pastor dot com um and, and a blog about this that um the wedding at Cana John mm -hmm. and john this this actually is a a wedding of the disciples that Jesus and the disciples are getting married um We don't know who the bride and groom are, but that story was a metaphor or a parable about the call of the disciples, basically. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful things about queer theology is, you know, we talk about lenses in different things. When you approach, in this case, scripture with a queer lens, you you break free from the binary, the heteronormative women as owned property by That's men right, yeah. um, lens. And, and you look at things and you're like, hmm, you know, David and Jonathan, when you hear, you read about their relationship, we... In, in the, the traditional heteronormative lens is like, oh, they were just really good friends. But with the queer lens, you're going, maybe they were also romantic partners. That's maybe right. that yeah, was part of right. the mix. And then also in Jesus's time, you know, this is the Greco-Roman world, uh, and Jesus was associating with all kinds of people. Um, maybe Jesus was fully human in his sexuality, too. It, right, it, that's right. It, it forces us to actually be open to some things um, that we may not otherwise allow ourselves to consider. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not making claims on any of this, but it's important to to look at things from multiple perspectives. Right. Mm -hmm. And being able to celebrate, I think that that's the thing, is being able to celebrate that queerness and also being able to celebrate our bodies. Yeah. Um, our, our sexual sex. bodies. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And seeing them as, um, as a part of God too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, what I love about queer theology is that it's really like looking for love. Right. That's you know, right. it's yeah. it's just really looking for where does love show up? Yeah. And it can't love can't just be in this like normative box that that's right. The culture has put it in. It must it must break. That's right. Free in all these different ways. Push against. Right. Push against. I think yeah. that that and that's and I think that that's one of the the invitations for queer theology in confronting scripture and um, even the rest of our lives. Right. Is um, what has society told me? that it should be. I don't have to live into that, right? I I can come to this text, I can come to my life with the freedom to choose, um, to say yes to things and say no, right? Queer theology, I think one of our uh, consent is a real thing. Um, what am I going to consent to and what am I going to say no to and allow those things to be clear? Yeah, it, it really calls us to our values. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So our next theological framework is womanist theology. And I think you're the resident yeah, expert, Raj. Yeah, I think Raj. so, Raj. Well, uh, yeah. I, well, I, I wouldn't say yes, I'm the expert, but I, it's something, it's it's a theology, theological perspective that I love. So a little bit of background on where womanist theology comes from. Can I interrupt you for a second? No. Alan's not here. Someone's got to interrupt. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I just, woman is theology. You're a man. Yeah, that, I was so, going to get there. Okay, you're going to get there. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, your, how your journey to, to woman is theology happened. So I studied woman is theology under an African-American woman is professor. Um, and she made the statement that um, woman is theology is one that has an open invitation uh, which was really exciting to me because I was very hesitant to, I, I still don't call myself a womanist theologian or a womanist, but a womanist ally. Uh, but she said, you know, if you study this and you have reverence for it and respect for it and the place that it holds, you're invited in. We're not trying to keep anybody out. Now, you, you have different perspectives mm -hmm. among scholars, but that was my teacher who introduced me to, to womanism. Mm -hmm. um, but it it comes from Alice Walker's work, the, the notion of womanist, in search of our mother's gardens, womanist prose. Um, so if you're familiar with Alice Walker, The Color Purple, maybe her most famous work, but an incredible writer, um, deeply, deeply spiritual and profound work. Uh, and it was three African-American theologians at Union Seminary, women theologians, Katie G. Cannon, Jacqueline Grant, and Dolores Williams, who gave birth to womanist theology. And the image that, that holds true for me and, and gives me a lot of meaning is the best theology happens around the kitchen table with mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, granddaughters, aunties, um, and, and cousins. Because while a lot of folks in the African-American African American women historically have been kept out of academia, um, but that doesn't mean great theological work, earth altering theological work, hasn't happened around the kitchen table. And I think it's such a beautiful construct. That's right. That's one of my. So I took womanist uh, theology classes in seminary as well, and that was always like the good news. Uh, hearing, oh yeah, hearing them right. share that theology. Um, the best theology doesn't happen in academia, right? Um, and it hasn't. I mean, read some of our uh, systematic theologians. That sh sucks. Um, <laughs> but is done around kitchen tables and on front porches as mothers and grandmothers are doing their daughter's hair. Mm -hmm. um, there's something profoundly beautiful about that. And anyone who's done youth ministry knows that to be true. Just mm -hmm. sitting, Just sitting around a campfire or sitting on a couch in a youth room and allowing young people to share their experiences of God um, mm -hmm. or anybody for that matter. Yeah. Um, that's where the true work is done. And the story sharing. Right. That's right. The the story sharing was because after taking that course, I begin to ask my women family members who, you know, I knew them, they were around, but I never really talked with elders, female elders in an open ended way. Because everything in the Indian family is around uh, fathers, husbands, and sons. No one, the women don't talk about themselves or their daughters. So I begin to ask 
relatives, like, tell me about your relationship and understanding with the divine, with God. And it was like, what? You want to know what I think? It's like, yes, I do. And I'm ashamed that it took taking a class in seminary to ask these questions of people that had been in my life all along. But it's it's revolutionary. And that theology happens everywhere all the time if you're open to it. Yeah, I um womanist theology is I think so powerful. You know, the um Alice Walker's vision of the world and um the stories that she's told in her works um paint a picture of God that is you don't see unless you actually sit around the kitchen table unless you actually are in relationship with people who um who are definitely not in the academy. I think about my own grandma who um you know didn't really have a formal education to speak of and the wisdom that I got get, got from her in some ways far surpasses any Karl Barth or any any of the theologians that I've read. Um like one thing that comes to mind right now is is that she always used to say if you share you'll always have enough it's just like this little nugget yeah. of like just five or six words and it kind of it says everything yeah but say say more about your grandma because that phrase coming from somebody who knows a little bit about your grandma's life is so powerful yeah my grandma my grandma uh she survived many, many hardships. Um, she comes from a family who uh, immigrated from Ukraine, and we don't even know the whole story because they would never talk about it. it anytime somebody asked them questions about the old world, they would just say, we're not there anymore. It was terrible. Don't ask any more questions. Um, and, you know, she grew up in this family with, um, I think she had eight siblings in her family and they couldn't feed all the kids. And so a couple of them had to be, had to grow up as other people's children because her parents couldn't uh, take care of all of them. So she knew her sister really as a friend who lived down the street um, in another person's home. Then she raised five kids all on her own because her husband died when uh, her youngest was six weeks old. And her oldest was like six years old, six or seven years old. So, yeah, she knows a lot about hardship. You know, my dad talks about um, having they grew up in Canada and having icicles hanging from the ceiling because of the cracks in the um, in the granary that they lived in. So for her to say, if you share, you'll always have enough adds a whole depth of meaning than it would be for me to say that today. Yeah. I mean, that's scripture. Yeah, it really is. For sure, for sure. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And and uh, I, I failed to mention my teacher, Dr. Valerie Miles Tribble at American Baptist Seminary of the West in Berkeley. Got to give her credit because that was a, a, a pretty transformative uh, coursework for me in my seminary experience. So shout out to Dr. V. Um. So now, a controversial and complex theology process. And Bonnie, you may be our resident expert on process theology. Yeah, maybe. Um, I love how we all come to this with like, <laughs> maybe, we're not really sure. <laughs> but. Oh, process theology is, is complex, um, but it, it feels really intuitive, too. Um, it's this idea that God and the world become together. There's, there's an open-ended future for God and for all of creation, and that they're sort of symbiotically related. And as God, as, as the world, as creation enlarges, God also enlarges. Um, so it's very rel relational. Um, God in process theology is, is not omniscient. Because God knows the future as much as we know the future. Um, neither is God omnipotent, but God is omnipresent in a very, in like a profound way to the 
God is present in the becoming of the cells in our bodies. God is present in the becoming of the atoms that are, you know, that make up the entire universe. So to me, it makes a lot of sense because it helps to resolve that question, that theological question, which might be interesting to talk about right now. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there okay. suffering in the world? H- hang on just a second. We're not jumping there just yet because you you dropped a couple of bombshells for most people in Christianity. Process theology has a God who is not all-knowing nor all-powerful. That's blasphemy. To Doesn't some. it just make a lot of sense, though? Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if sure. God is all-knowing yeah. and all-powerful, what the hell? But that, I mean, you, you, I mean, for the three of us, we encountered this some time ago and have had time to process. But I remember first hearing this, and I first heard this as somebody who was going through a pretty devout period of secularism. So I wasn't really attached to God. But when I heard this idea of God not being all-powerful or all-knowing, all it was disorienting to me. Yeah. So I can't imagine what that, how disorienting it might be to folks who are very attached to that dynamic of God. So can you revisit that before we go to this next aspect? Um, yeah. Re- revisit the notion of God being. Yeah. Let, let's. Yeah. H- how, how did that like sink in for you? Well, I think part of the process of deconstructing what I considered really bad theology was God for me shattered into a million pieces. And that might not be everybody's experience. Um, But for me, you know, I I basically came to a place where I looked at theologies around hell. I looked at theologies of the chosen and the unchosen. I looked at theologies, you know, like a prosperity gospel type theology, which kind of you know, it was, it's kind of there, you know, if you're blessed, you know, you're blessed because God blesses you. And um, if you don't have things, then there might be, there must be something wrong in your life. And I, I just came to a place where I was like, if that's the way God works, then F God. I mean, I, I was like a real, it was a really, that, that was my big moment, I think, of deconstruction. And so since God shattered into a million pieces, uh, there, there was a huge emptiness in my soul with, with God not, with not having language for God and yet feeling somehow, somewhere, there must be more. There must be more. There must be a beyond, a transcendent. So, um, when I heard this idea of process theology, it felt like living water. Hell yeah. Yeah. It just, it felt like, oh, my parchedness might be quenched. Um, and reconstructing ideas about God that other people had thought about for a long time and had created a whole system around. Um, and it just, it just totally made sense to me. I mean, let's talk about how abusive and all knowing and all all powerful God actually is that in your suffering, God knows and God has the power to fix it and chooses not to so that you might learn some great lesson that'll make you stronger for the next time something really happens to you. I mean, that's outrageous. I really love process theology for this. There's something comforting in knowing that God is on this journey with us. I, I remember hearing a process theologian talking at a convention and someone was asking about um, global warming. And they were like, uh, you know, so basically, how do you feel about global warming? Like, you took an airplane to get here. Basically, just being so rude to this theologian. And they said, God will be with us through this process of global warming the same way God was with Jesus in the crucifixion. And there's something super, super painful and yet relieving about that, right? That like God is in this process with us, will love us through through the pain of things that we do to ourselves, including destroy the planet. Right. There 
and maybe there that's like a twisted hope but it brought hope to me that like god doesn't have all the answers and god doesn't can't magically wave a magic wand and fix it but god is with us in co-creating to make the world better so if we want this stuff to be fixed then we have to um, reimagine the world with god right right and that's that's that lure right that's right that you're always talking about that, that i love yeah yeah it, one of the hardest parts i think of process theology for a lot of people is it puts responsibility on us right right and you know, the devil there's a lot can't of, make you do it. Well, right. and there's a lot of comfort to being able to blame something else. Right, that's right. And in process theology, it's relational. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's kind of a little bit troubling, probably, to think that we are, uh, in essence, um, although essence isn't really part of process theology, but that we are more powerful than God. God can only invite us. Our becoming global warming, whatever it is that we make together, it's it's on us. God is just there to be with us, to um, lure us, invite us to, to really um, move towards beauty, towards restoration, towards wholeness. But God does not decide that for us. Yeah, I can, I can hear people shuddering. <laughs> you know, with and that, I'm like, that this idea. is the good news, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, it's it's a truly different paradigm, and um, it it is liberating to many. It's disturbing to some. Uh, it's downright blasphemy to others. And uh, you know, there's a lot of churches we'd get kicked out of mm -hmm. um, because of a, of an embrace of process theology. Yeah, you know, there's there's like various versions of process theology that are pretty popular right now, especially among progressive Christians. Um, Richard Rohr, when he talks about the cosmic Christ, which is an, an ongoing becoming where Christ and the world sort of become together is is a kind of process theology. It's a kind of a, you know, an offshoot of process theology. Teilhard de Chardin, who was like a a mystic and uh, writer, he sort of like set a proposition, which is another process term. He sort of threw something into the future from where he stood as he wrote about this kind of unfolding of Christ. Um, and then a lot of quite a few ca Catholic theologians have picked up on that and continued it forward, in including Richard Rohr in some really beautiful ways. Um, so I think process theology is. Christian, like it's Absolutely. deeply Christian. Absolutely. It goes back to early, early Christianity. It, we're we're rediscovering it and we're reclaiming it in a more scientific framework because that's the reality that we live in. I mean, Jesus himself, I think, questioned ideas about God. Right, and isn't that what we're doing? I mean, even on this podcast, like your progressive imagination, right? I mean. That's that's sort of the invitation that I think that and that's sort of what we bring to this podcast, the three of us um, joining with Jeff and Alan. You know, Alan is claimed to fame as he's the biblical scholar among us. And Absolutely. I think we're like the cynical theologians who have lots of questions about the Bible and for Alan. Yeah. Um, and so um, I think that that's the good news for anyone who's listening and maybe shuddering like. All of this is an invitation to wonder about your own faith, your own journey. If you're listening to this, my guess is many of you have already started that process. And so uh, I hope that, that all of this just allows for people who are listening to really begin to wonder for themselves what is true. I mean, how do you liberate your own self? How do you begin to push against the norms that you have been taught to find the, the one who lures you? Right. Yeah, that's so well said, Casey. Yeah. Absolutely. There are possibilities out there beyond a very rigid and fixed way of thinking of God. Well, what what's one of your favorite process theology books, Bonnie? Um, well, I like Alfred North Whitehead's um Process and Reality. Um that's kind of the founding book. But uh, process the theology books, um I think Catherine Keller has some good books. 
I like Monica Coleman, who who brings together process theology and womanist theology. Yeah, I was going to say my favorite is Monica Coleman's uh, Making a Way Out of No Way. Yeah, Making a Way Out of No Way. She may have written some other books, too, since then. Yeah, and, and I think there's some poetry, too. That's really beautiful, process theology poetry. I think of my professor, Christina Hutchins, and um, her poetry. Yeah, it's good stuff. Casey, what are your, what are your takeaways from process theology? They're from the Reverend Bonnie Rambop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Casey, you're totally a press, process theologian. I am, I am, but it, but it comes from being a liberation theologian, yeah. right? A queer theology person, absolutely. Um, that that my understanding of Christ is rooted in my being and in the being of others. And so I, it doesn't scare me to see this journey as a process and alluring, alluring us to be better in the world. So yeah, that's why I love it so much is that of course, of course we are co-creators with Christ. Of course we are on this journey together because it's rooted in our experience. Yeah. I think, you know, long before the transition from fundamentalism, I, the the sense that this life, this spiritual path was a journey, there wasn't a destination, um, was setting in. And that was part of the reason for falling away from fund- fundamentalism and, you know, continuing to search and so on. And then encountering, encountering process theology, that's really at the core of it, is it's a continual unfolding, a creating, a recreating, and it just keeps moving. I remember being, uh, having pastors, youth pastors, when they were telling us to, you know, share the gospel with our friends, right? Um, if they can't hear the truth of the Bible, they'd say, then share your testimony because no one can ever argue that. And I think that, I mean, that for me is where liberation theology and even process theology, like this is our lived experience, right? If you can't, I mean, some of us can't even get to the Bible anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. And so, but to say that there's still something that resonates in us that is um, full of abundant life and wholeness that's calling us into a better way of being, um, that that is a testimony worth living into and telling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So last phase of this conversation. <laughs> in 30 words or less. I'm just kidding. Um, what's your personal theology? At, at this point in time, how would you describe it? Raj, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I could do that. So um, I've come to the understanding that the most powerful force in the universe is creativity. You know, creativity is behind, you know, if, if as we know it, the Big Bang happened the way we think it might have happened. You know, what are two random objects doing smashing into each other? Well. You know, what is... Uh, that's where queer theology can uh, step in for Yeah, you. <laughs> but, you know, that that's where four, you know, a, a four-year-old sitting around with nothing better to do is going to start smashing stuff together to see what happens. So creativity is there. It's in the universe. It's curious. It's wanting to see what will happen. And creativity has no moral compass. It's just about creating. And sometimes creating means causing harm in the way we might see harm. But it's just creating. It's like, let's blow something up. That's a creative endeavor. Let's do a painting. That's a creative endeavor. So God comes along and is like, hey, hey, that the lure thing that Bonnie talked about, God's whispering to us, you know, hey, hey, harness that creative power for beauty. Harness that creative power for beauty. Mm-hmm. And and then, you know, we go from there. And, and And it is, you know, the scary thing is it is up to us on how we're going to respond. Mm-hmm. Because we've seen the evidence of creativity used for evil and subjugation and harm um, almost everywhere you look. But if you look a little deeper, you'll also find creative force used for profound good mm-hmm. and profound art and things that are inspirational. And then that you've got mixed in with it that intense relationality because where it gets really complicated is what might be beautiful and helpful in one context could be troubling and harmful in another context. Mm -hmm. So that, that relationality with the divine, with creative power is 
ongoing and ever evolving. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am today. You want to go, Casey? Um, God is love. Mm -hmm. is simple, right? God is love. And, and the way that I, I see that in the rest of the world is, and the way that I, I invite into my theology, this idea is, um, if I'm not starting with love, then I'm missing the point altogether. And so, um, everything that I seek to do, everything that I seek to preach is rooted in this idea of love. My definition of love is always working for the good of another. And I believe that that, again, is that, that idea of process, right? That God is luring us in mm -hmm. love to do the right thing, to be the best we can be. Um, but we have to live into that. We have to step into that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of those things, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. That's love, right? Treat others as you would want someone to treat you. All of these things are rooted in this relational, loving essence, Love is enough. I've been, I, I've, as we've been talking, I've been doodling, and that's just what's been arising for me. Love is enough. Cornell West, um, justice is love in public, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the driving force of the universe, love. And yet it is the thing that we all struggle with the most, the struggle to love ourselves, the struggle to love our neighbor. And it's because love requires vulnerability. It requires sacrifice, and it requires us to show up. And all of those things are not things that we like do on neutral. <laughs> you know that we are that yeah. that we are prone to. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's where I am today. Yeah, and mine's even shorter. I think if I were to distill my theology into as few words as, pos as possible, I would just say, um, God is. And um, to come to that was a journey, a huge journey. You know, C.S. Lewis, his argument for God is, you know, surprised by joy. Because like in an, an evolutionary, biological evolutionary framework, what is joy for? Like what, why would we have joy to, for, you know, in the evolutionary process if there weren't something divine behind joy? Um, and I think... You know, when you look into the eyes of a newborn baby, you you know, at least my experience, like right from the beginning, that there's a depth in the eyes of a child that has just come into the world and taken their first first breaths, where where the it's a soul that was born, you know, not not just a mass of of cells, and it's not that we have. It's not a one or the other. It's that spirit Im is imbued in everything um, in the world. And so, yeah, God, God is. And then we fill in the blanks as we journey along for what comes after that. Wow. Well, thanks, friends. This is a great conversation. Jeff and Alan, we missed you a lot. Yes, we did. I can feel your energy wanting to interact with this conversation or interrupt Alan <laughs> from wherever you, you might be. We we've missed you and look forward to having all five of us back at the mics on our next episode. Let us know what you think to add your voice to this particular conversation. Comment on the show notes at arenacast.com slash one three six. Also on the show notes, you'll find relevant links and a complete list of all the other ways to like follow and contact the show. That's arenacast.com slash 136. On the other side of the music, we will play Bottom 3. I love bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> so for this segment, we're playing a game called Bottom 3. And... We are going to list our three bottom favorite Christian phrases. Casey's going to start. All right. The first one is, I'm praying for you. Oh, my God. Gross. Yes. I remember coming out and people walking through the hallway and saying, I'm praying for you. And I remember, I just remember being like, please stop. <laughs> <laughs>
Just yeah. stop. I don't yeah. want your prayers. I don't need them. But, you know, hang on a second. But what about if, like, it's something you actually want some prayer for? I guess it's intention, right? I don't know. It feels, it just feels gross to me. Yeah. Like, I'm praying for you. Yeah. It de- I guess it depends who yeah, says it. I say it I, because I yeah. I know you say it too, right? Yeah. We all say it. Yeah. That's maybe we need to find better language. I maybe. Mean. I mean, I kind of like it when people pray for me because I'm like going to the doctor. Yeah. Or but something. certain people say it. You don't want them praying for that's you. Right. Well, right. yeah. But it's, it's the same words, different meaning, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next one. Jeez Louise. Too blessed to be stressed. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that make your skin crawl? Yes. Yeesh. And lastly, I didn't say it. The Bible did. Oh. Yeah. Those that's are good. so good. That's got Mike Pence written all over it. Yeah, I didn't say it. The Bible did. Hmm. Do Go you know on. Greek and Hebrew? <laughs> so my least favorite Christian phrases. All right. Uh, number three. God is good all the time, all the time. God, God is, is good. good. Yeah, I hate that. I've hated that for so long. Yeah, it's not true. Well, there's so many people suffering. That's what I'm saying. Right? And so what about them? Oh, I just, I, it's it's just like, stop being real. That's what it says. It's like, stop being real in this moment. Put on your plastic face. Yeah, totally. Plastic face. <laughs> so my, my uh, number two is... It's all part of God's plan. Oh, that's a bad one. That's too. a really bad one. Yeah. I hate that one. Um, and then my my number one least favorite Christian phrase is God and country. God and country. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I mean we could go off on any one of these, right? Bonnie, you're winning. Politics so far, is so. not a religion. Thank you. Thank you. You wouldn't know that by looking around. Um, so my, my least favorite Christian phrases, bottom three, there's a reason for your suffering. Oh yeah, that's bad. That's terrible. I mean that it ties into that God has a plan, right? Mm-hmm. Cause that's usually when people say it. Um, the other one is let go, let God. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't even what understand. Is that, even, that. is that like related to Jesus take the wheel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I oh, remember hearing Jesus that take all the, wheel. the time. We could have said Jesus take the wheel. Jesus take the wheel. I like that one. I, just I, do too, I like the song. Actually, yeah. I, I think it's bad theology. We just talked about process theology, right. and now it, we're asking Jesus yeah. to take well, the wheel. It's it, like okay, it's bad theology, Lord, but I'm, it's okay. I'm following the Lord. <laughs> oh God, <that's, laughs> look, this is all triggering. <laughs> well, maybe Jesus was behind the self-driving cars. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. So, what was your number two again? No, let I, go, I, let God. Let go, let God. Yeah. Like, but I mean, that too, it flies in the face of any sort of responsibility. Like you just. Yeah, do nothing. It'll all work out. Or pray harder or whatever. Yeah. And then my least, my least favorite at the very bottom is thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many it, How many people were gunned down in the last month? Right. It's 96 people a day yeah. are gunned right. down in and, this country. And right. thoughts and prayers. It's ridiculous. I think we should just have thoughts and prayers for the wall, right? Yeah. Let's, yeah, just, exactly. have thought, let's yeah. just have thoughts and that, prayers that for the wall. That should be yeah. enough. Right. That should, that should be, enough. be enough. That should be if enough. If we're so worried about terrorists coming over the border, if we should just have lots of thoughts and prayers. That that takes care of it right there. Right. So out, out of these ones, we just threw out nine. Which one gave your body the most heat? Thoughts and prayers. Really? Yeah. yeah. I think so, too. Mm. I think so, too. It's... it's uh, I don't know. There's just something so disconnected about that. And it's timely. Yeah. Right. It's, it's all over social media every time there's a disaster. Mm-hmm. Right. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts and prayers don't feed people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Doesn't heal people. Doesn't mm-hmm. comfort people. But it makes you feel better that you posted it on Facebook. I can't, I'm not doing anything, but at least I can post on Facebook. Thoughts and prayers. Right. I wonder... Anyway, that's that's I, I just I don't know it. It just feels so oogie though. I love how this is supposed to be fun. I and know we just made we, this, we just we just this got is what all... happens when you put the three theologians <laughs> together, right? This is why we need Alan this and Jeff. Alan and Jeff would have we're like doom and gloom. They would have diverted. I know we're all like yeah, so okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it, I thought we'd come up with funnier stuff. This is kind of a downer. Well, I mean, like Jeff always says, do you want to cleanse the palate cleanse with something? Yeah. 
Well, okay. Here's here's one, and this is going to be off the top of your heads. What's like what's like a, a good little church joke? I can tell you a real story. Okay. Is it funny? It's funny. Okay. I had a colleague who he was in his internship year for seminary and was super pumped coming home every week after church saying there was this little old lady who was saying, your sermons are changing my life. And uh, right before he was, it was I maybe it was like even his last Sunday. He preached this great sermon, or what he thought was she was, you know, she, you know, right there with him, smiling, big grin. And uh, this lady's daughter was with her this Sunday, and she walks up, and you know, the old lady says, "Oh, pastor, that was the best sermon you've preached since you've been here. God bless you on your journey." And next in line to walk out the door is a daughter, and she said. Pastor, thank you for being so welcoming to my mother. She's been deaf for about five years now, um, but she loves coming to church. <laughs> That's so great. That was pretty funny. I think we end on that. Okay. Well, I, I had one though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This was this was sort of like it's a dad joke and a church joke. So um, this father and daughter, Bonnie, stop rolling your eyes. People can't see that. <laughs> it has no value in this space. Um, a, 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 my thoughts and prayers are with you. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> so this dad and daughter walk to church. The church is in the neighborhood, and they love like hopping and skipping and jumping and just having a great time till they get about a block away. And then the dad's like, "Okay, it's time to get quiet because we're about to go into church." And um, on this one day, he realized, you know, his daughter is asking a lot of questions about all kinds of things. So. He thinks, you know, this at this point in their walk, their Sunday morning walk to church, he should explain why they get, you know, uh, why they get quiet before walking into church. So they get a block away and he, he turns to his daughter and says, do you know why we get quiet and a little more still when we walk into church? She's like, yeah, people are sleeping in there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's, That's a good one. That's great. That is actually true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's... So with that, that will do it for this week. Bonnie, how can people find you and what you have going on on the interwebs? I'm at Parkside Community Church in Sacramento and also on Facebook at Bonnie Lang Rambob. Casey. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rev Tenen, or you can follow me on my Instagram um, or find me at my blog, which is The Queerly Faithful Pastor, or you can find me on Facebook at Casey Tenen. And you can follow me at facebook.com slash Rev Raj Rambob. As for Arenacast, don't forget to describe, subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. We are available on all major podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. And while you're there, if your platform allows it, leave us a rating and or review. We're always looking for more and more ways to hear from you. You can also fill out our listener survey at arenacast.com slash survey. The information you give us is super helpful as we move forward and continue to evolve the show. That's at arenacast.com slash survey. So for this week, this is Raj. I'm Bonnie. This is Casey. Thanks for joining the conversation. Peace. Peace.